Hello, welcome to Late Night Latte on Latte Firm. It is Thursday the 4th of April and it's just gone 10pm in the UK. I've just hate-watched Liverpool massively unsuccessfully. I hate, hate watching Liverpool. I don't know why I do it, but I fell into it. They reeled me in, especially when Sheffield United equalised and I watched it and I wanted to cry at the end. But there we are. Manchester United are currently 3-2 up at Stamford Bridge as well and that is where Liverpool go at the weekend. So hopefully Egghead... Uh, can do something for us this weekend. Who knows? A warm welcome to one and all. Uh, I hope you guys are all well. Hope you guys have had a great week. The games are coming thick and fast. It's only a couple of days rest because we head to the seaside on Saturday to play Brighton. I've got a great panel tonight. We're going to look back at last night's win over Luton, standout performances from a rotated team. We will look at the title race, of course. And of course, uh, there's been a lot of talk about Kai Havertz and how he settled in at number nine. Do we actually need a new striker? We'll talk about that as well. And of course, we'll take your chats. And it's to the chat that we'll go first. Tamina, first in the house. Hi, Latte Firm. How are you doing today? Well, I was good. I had a great day at work. I've been enjoying the glorious sunshine in central London. But the result at Anfield has really peed me off. Uh, yeah, that's just the way that I uh, that I feel. She's very optimistic about Brighton. 12 nil. Not sure about that, Tamina, uh, but I appreciate the sentiment of keeping up the good work. Love that. Uncle Doris in the house. Evening all. Lou Weed. Oi, oi. Uh, Afsar Gunner. Evening Gunners. And yes, I'm buzzing. Come on, you Gunners. Hope Liverpool drop points soon. They have five away games in their last eight. Three of those come in a six day spell after a trip to Atalanta. I think that's the week that we all have to wait for. Uh, Awatunde, Christopher Adebayo says, good evening, Gunas. Good evening to you, my friend. Patrick is in the house as well. Good evening, Trevor Bibbins, Oisin. Keep the chat coming. And of course, if you're tuning in for the first time, please do subscribe to the channel and uh, like the video. It's a massive help to the channel. And I can see that there are hundreds of you watching across both platforms already. So a very warm welcome. Let's bring in our panelists. First up, she needs no introduction. It's my fellow Rob Andrews ogler, Laura Kirk. How are you doing? I'm good, FK. Have we have we calmed down from being in the vicinity of Rob Edwards last night? I don't think so because I've seen all the footage and when, when do you know what I've subs I've followed Luton now because I I I, I need that. Here's the box. Here's the boss fix. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they tweet that, you just know it's going to be a video of him. I mean, what a gorgeous man, really. It, yeah, you, and I think the added um, the added benefit of him talking so politely and in admiration of Arsenal really adds like a like another layer to it. Um, I, I definitely annoyed the people around me last night uh, with my taking pictures of Rob and also trying to get his attention um, because I don't sit that far behind the the bench. So I tried, I tried, but um, yeah, what a gorgeous man. I don't think Luton are going to stay up, which is a shame, um, but you know, we'll probably keep an eye on them, how they're doing in the championship. They've, they've definitely got another fan you know, sat here and probably sat where you are as well. So indeed, indeed. Uh, at least you didn't get arrested. So that's progress. <laughs> and listen, Rob, <laughs> Rob Andrews might might not be at Luton in the summer. If they go down, I think there'll be some suitors uh, circling. He's done a great job at Luton. The resources that they have and, of course, the performances and the way that they play football, even though they lost last night. Um, but there's a lot to like about them. Thank you, Laura, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Anybody wants to follow Laura, she's available on X, Laura Kirk 12. It's a firm debut tonight for the deputy editor of Ask Blog News and good friend, Andrew Allen. Andrew, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's an honour to be on. Oh, mate, it's a pleasure to have you on. I uh, followed you for a long time on socials. I love your takes and your work on Ask Blog. Thank you very much. Um, if anybody wants to follow Andrew, you can, of course, engage with him on X at A Allen Sport. Uh, Andrew, just tell the viewers in case they're asleep because Ask Blog is gargantuan. What is it that you do there? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've spent the last 12 years since we since we launched Ask Blog News writing every day about Arsenal. I think I've done something like 8,000 articles at this point uh, over that period. So, um, yeah, I feel like I've, I've kind of got to know the club pretty well. Um, yeah, so it's it's a, it's pretty full on, but I do that kind of alongside a day job. So there's a lot of juggling going on, but it is it is great. I mean, Ask Blog over the years is just, as you say, has grown huge. And um, the Patreon, there's an amazing community there. And, you know, I think this month we're giving a load of money um, from our Patreon uh, subscriptions over to UNICEF as well. So there's, you know, warm, fuzzy feelings working for for such a great brand. So, yeah, I love it. Um, Mate, the work that you guys do, and Andrew's such a gent as well, I've been reading following ask blog from well since the start you know reading the articles on the way on the tube to work when we used to work five days a week in the office uh, i used to get my <laughs> daily fix at weekends and 
it's just so nice that you guys are doing such great things and you're so successful. And of course, the kind donation to UNICEF, which I saw the post about yesterday. Um, phenomenal. Welcome to the show, my friend. Um, and obviously, you've been supporting Arsenal pretty much your whole life. Yeah, uh, the family ties. I think my first game was 1987. Uh, yeah, so we're going back a long, long way. Uh, first evening game actually was against Luton, so that kind of uh, brought back memories last night. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a it's been a long and uh, interesting uh, sort of life, I guess, supporting Arsenal. I mean, I, I think I assumed in my younger years that success was just a given, and. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, lived through the last 20 years of the trophy uh, drought on the Premier League front. It's been uh, a little bit stressful, but, you know, keep your fingers crossed, right? Indeed. Well, listen, we don't know how the season is going to end. There is a lot of football to play and we are in a good place. Uh, let's start with you, given that the, this fixture is particularly kind of, I guess, sentimental to you. Um, what was your mood like going into the game? Because there was a lot of energy exhausted at the Etihad at the weekend. A lot was made of it by the neutrals and non-Arsenal fans. And I'm just going to bring up the team news that was shared before the game. Obviously, we cruised to victory last night. But were you in confident mood? What did the sort of lineup when it was announced? How did that make you feel? Yeah, I mean, I... I... I, look, I mean, it's always slightly surprising to see Arteta make as many as five changes. Um, he tends to stick with what he knows, but he, I think, had a pretty good sense of the state of the squad. And obviously, we know we are going into a, a huge run of fixtures and the games are every three, four days. So it completely made sense to do what he did. And actually, when you look at what he did, it didn't really feel like there was too much of a, a drop off, right? I mean, bringing Zinchenko and Party back into the team to very serious players who've been a huge part of the Arteta project over the last couple of years. Um, you know, Nelson's always had his moments and I think it was exactly the right time to give Saka a little bit of a breather because it's pretty clear he's been in struggling the last couple of weeks. Um, Trossard, I mean, he's he's always good value. And, um, you know, Smith Rowe, I guess, was the kind of the, the surprise one. Um, and, you know, there's not an Arsenal fan out there, I don't think, that doesn't want to see Emil Smith-Rowe succeeding. You know, we know what he can do uh, when he's on his game and when he's fully fit. So giving him an opportunity to shine is, you know, was perfect. And I think quite a few, there was a bit of a buzz around the pub, certainly pre-game when people saw Smith-Rowe's name. So, yeah, I, I thought it was a good decision. I think it paid off, right? Well, yeah, I mean, obviously with the benefit of hindsight, having see, having sort of sat through the game, yes, it did pay off. I got to be honest, though, I wasn't as calm as you, Andrew, when when I saw the lineup. So obviously, look, as you guys can see, courtesy of Arsenal.com, Raya in goal, Ben White, Saliba, Gabriel Sinchenko coming in at left back ahead of Kivior. Party coming in uh, to play alongside Smith Rowe. So two changes out of the three central midfielders and Erdegaard. Nelson coming in because no Saka, no Martinelli. Trossard playing out wide alongside Havertz. And the bench is looking strong. We're getting good options on the bench at the right time of the season. I was a little bit nervous, Laura, because Thomas Party has made a couple of cameo appearances. I would say that it was more him going out for a jog rather than anything else. So I was a little bit nervous. Uh, Sinchenko, look, we know he's reliable in games against opposition like this. Smith Rowe, who hasn't played in a long time, certainly hasn't started in a long time. Um, I just felt a little bit anxious. And of course, without the wide men that we know and love, that we see, you know, bail us out of games week after week, time after time. I, I was edgy. How did you feel, Laura? I was a little bit edgy when I saw the team come out. Um, I, I was expecting Zinchenko to come in, but Smith Rowe certainly was a, a pleasant surprise in hindsight. Um, same same thing as, as as Andrew though. I was on the tube when the um, when the team sheet came out, and you could kind of hear this sort of rippling of oh, Emil Smith Rowe. You know, he, he when when we we've asked for rotation, and he really has rotated, rotated. Um, I, I just felt nervous because, as you said. You know, these this team that you have before you, they've not played together. So not only have you got, to, you know, individuals coming back from long periods on the sidelines, you've got a slightly, you know, new um, structure in place, new relationships. You know, Nelson's not played. I, I can't remember when the last time he started. I think it was something ridiculous, like 2020. Um, so you've got the kind of double whammy of um, players coming back from injury, and also, you know, players playing together who haven't so far. So, and, and the added nervousness of, you know, this time last year, I think we, we've all seen that tweet that said this was a game where we started to unravel. And so this fit, this felt like it could be, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a, unfortunately a pessimistic Arsenal fan. So everything I see is a banana skin, but putting out essentially a second, second string team against a Luton 
team who are you know fighting for survival could in theory have been a bit of a banana skin so I'm yeah I, I sat in my seat a little bit nervous um but having the strength on the bench and we did end up having to use it just to get a little bit more control back into the game um that was reassuring um and the one thing that you know we can take from the city game is I was like even with Zinchenko and, and his little yips that we see we still got Saliba and Gabriel I just I don't know how Luton are scoring the only way they're scoring is through a mistake so a little bit tetchy but ultimately that the quality of the opposition probably wasn't there probably didn't need to be quite as nervous as it was goodness me there is a penalty at Stamford Bridge but I'm because I'm on lag it's Chelsea's penalty uh, I'm judging by the reaction have they missed what's going on someone let me know in the chat Penalty to Chelsea at Stamford Bridge. Chelsea 2, Manchester United 3. They must be deep into injury time. It's my fault for scheduling this at such an awful time. <laughs> uh, we were all watching it. We were all watching this sort of, you know, mid-table Classico. But the drama is well and truly there. I don't know. Has the pen gone in? Uh, is it, have any of you got access to it? <laughs> I'm waiting for BBC to refresh. This is terrible. We'll this is so bad. <laughs> this is live uh, TV, yeah. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is how it works. And Someone by the way, the I've made it. To help. I've made a t- yeah. Someone, I'm 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 keeping an eye on Twitter. Uh, I've completely missed a snack check as well. What a terrible, what a terrible way to start the show. Tyler Blake says, "Damn, I miss snack check." It's a Terry's chocolate orange for me. Uh, I have a an elite snack check tonight, Laura. I'm going to go straight out of the straight out of the blocks. All VARs getting involved. They're checking it. Was it a foul? Oh. I've got some M&S handcrafted red onion regato and mozzarella pantofola, which I've just baked in the old oven. It's uh, it's basically a lot of um. Ooh, that looks red. very nice. Yeah, it's very a lot of, nice. Uh, it's a basic, a lot of dough with some caramelized onions on top and some cheese. You've and... been really oh, the what snacks. The, what was it the other night? The eclair. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the eclair the other night. M&S well, food. Basically, just... Andrew, I've been away to Thailand. I've been eating lots and lots of like noodles and fried stuff and rice and steak. And I came back and I thought, you know what? I need an M&S fix. I yeah, need some do nice. It. That's fair. Basic foods. Chocolate eclairs. Mm. Oh, no wow. need to get beach body ready when you've already done the beach, right? You damn right, baby. <laughs> you damn right. You know the game. Um, okay, someone just sent me a little picture of uh, Cole Palmer with a smiley emoji. Has he scored? Has he missed? Someone in the chat, let me know. Uh, Laura, what have you got for a snack tonight? Three three. Three, Goal. three three. Yeah, he's just scored three three. Okay. <laughs> Good. Right, Laura, let's get back to business. What have you got tonight? I haven't got anything tonight, FK. I've just got a cup of tea. I've just been out for dinner. So, you Ooh, know. Where'd you go? What I, did you do? Uh, I went to Market Halls on Oxford Street. You know, one of those ones where there's lots of little lots of little fancy. things. Um, not fancy at all, but this is what everyone else should have been doing rather than sitting at home watching Liverpool, you know. Ob- obviously, I'm there checking my phone and got very excited <laughs> when I saw one all. Um, but, you know, so that, I've just got a cup of tea this, this evening. Enjoy the brew, Andrew. Are you are you uh, you know um, partial to sort of you know late night treat? Uh, I am, and I've, I've I've gone Italian for you because we've had a few messages in the past where you've suggested some Stanley Tucci like similarities. Oh, yes. So I've gone with a little Tuscan biscotti oh. number, oh. Um, which has actually come from uh, yeah Tuscany. Uh, you are a cultured man. I thank, love it. I thought I'd treat you to that, but um, yeah, I haven't quite tucked in yet. I'm going to wait for a, a, a break in play. Enjoy. Uh, Enjoy, yeah. my friend. Uh, right, let's get back to Arsenal. Someone let me know when it's full time so I can stop stressing about this. <laughs> uh, by the way, there are almost 700 of you watching live right now. Very, very grateful for your company. Please do like the video and, of course, subscribe if you are tuning in for the first time. Apparently, Chelsea have almost just won it. Drama at the bridge. Right. Let's move on to the match stats and key moments, courtesy of Premier League.com and Opta Analyst. Uh, there you can see the stats on screen, ladies and gents, boys and girls. We did win by two goals to nil. A really low XG, though, for Arsenal. It felt like that sort of a game. That It didn't feel like there were like too many clear-cut chances. Second half, we completely took our foot off the gas, which I want to talk about in just a second. We had 13 shots on goal compared to Luton's five, four on target compared to their one. And we bossed uh, possession, 60% almost to 42% for Luton. Um, Laura, sticking with you, what did you make of that game? And in particular, the playing style of the second half, we completely let up, didn't we? We did. Um, and I think we can all remember how it felt last year going 2-0 up um, and what that felt like to then draw those two games. 
Um, no way. 4-3. What is going on? What's going on? To who? 4-3 to Chelsea. <laughs> oh, my days. <laughs> my my my. What's going on? Has you scored? This is like, do you know what? This has just ruined my whole day. Not yeah. to see you guys, but like I, I hate hated watching Liverpool. I wanted to enjoy some prime Barclays and I've gone live way too soon. And I've ruined your evenings as well because you were watching it. Andrew was watching it in such, such, such. And the post-match would have been so amusing. Should we just chuck this? Should we can it? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> we've got hundreds of people watching, so we can't. Okay, let, let, let's. Oh, well, don't tell me it was McTominay. Was it McSauce? Of course. Sorry, Andrew. This is a this is a private thing. I absolutely love right. Scott McTominay. I think he's their best player. I would love to see him at Arsenal. Uh, I cannot believe it. Everyone in the chat is going nuts. <laughs> McSauce, of course. Wow. Okay, this is surreal, right, Andrew? This is not normally how the shows go. Okay, so I'm, I'm enjoying it. I, live radio is my <laughs> favorite kind of radio. <laughs> please do come again. This is nuts. Everyone's having a laugh at United. oyson has got the older uh, smiley emojis, and is it, it is four three full time. Albrecht oh my now, listen, goodness me! Quick question, uh, Andrew. Let's go to you. Would you have rather United lost or won tonight ahead of their fixture at Liverpool uh, against Liverpool at the weekend? Oh, I always want to see United lose. Always, yeah. I can't. So, I can't. I can't let go of all that hurt. The weekend, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think you know they all receive. They can lean on the fact they beat Liverpool in the FA Cup recently and all the emotion of that. So they know they can do it if they, you know, if they can be bothered to turn up. Losing in this way, they've now got something to prove as well. They've got to bounce back. I, that's what I want to see. I want to see <laughs> Liverpool. I, I want to see Liverpool get turned over. United have to deliver. <laughs> Anthony apparently is crying on the pitch. Oh my! That God. is a wonderful <laughs> way. That is a wonderful <laughs> oh, vision. To hang have. it in the Louvre. Exactly. Uh, right. Sorry, Laura. You were talking about the performance. What was I even talking about? Does it matter? Does it? Does it matter? Probably. Probably. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the performance last yeah. night. Let, let's just skip to that question about the second half. We'll talk about the goals yeah. in just a moment, but. The second half was distinctly different to anything that I've seen Arsenal do this season. And I don't know if it was intentional. I I don't think Mikel would have said to the team, let up, you know, just chill, relax, see it through and and look ahead to Brighton. I think the boys did take their foot off the gas. And I had this niggling feeling just walking away from the ground. Are we going to be made to regret not going for the kill? What did you make of that, Laura? I think we, I agree. I I think we lost a lot of our kind of intensity um, and we were sloppy. Um, with with some of the passing, which just invited a load of pressure um, and a sort of like slightly nervousness in the crowd. Um, and I think we lost a lot of our kind of like 50-50 balls, which just, you know, you could kind of feel the Luton bench, the Luton players just kind of sensing a little bit of an opportunity here. Um, and I think the, the, the biggest kind of like symbol of that was we had to bring on Jorginho and Rice to essentially give us a bit more control. Like nothing says we need to finish out this game, like bringing on Jorginho. Um, And I think a lot of the players that we saw who'd come in were absolutely gassed. Like clearly, you know, Smith Rowe cannot do 90 minutes given where he's been for the past, you know, months or so. And you just saw tiredness, sloppiness. I don't even know if it's lack of concentration. It was literally like a kind of balloon deflating, both in terms of the atmosphere and the play. Um, on the one hand, the job felt like it was done, but on the other, it just it felt slightly unnecessary, lacking in the kind of like ruthless edge that we've had in the past couple of couple of games. Um, ultimately, does it matter? I don't think so. I, I, I'm really not that bothered by it. I know lots of people are kind of, oh, yeah, that was a bit concerning, but we got three points against a relatively poor opposition. We were able to play some, we were able to rest some players. Ultimately, we did what was needed of us. We're not going to win every game 6-0. Um, and we came away from it uninjured with three points. So get out of your systems now if you're going to have a 45 minutes where we all just have a little bit of a little bit of a chill. Um, but don't do it again. I think that, that I don't think it's deeper than that. Yeah, that's like, you know, like a head teacher, don't I? Don't do that again. You know, you've had your moment. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. you're probably I, look, I'm more relaxed about it now because you know, four or five hours ago, I was expecting Liverpool to to really pump Sheffield United tonight. They are easily the, one of the worst teams I've ever seen in the Premier League. They've conceded something like so 67, goals. 68 goals in 29 games. Goal difference of minus 50 before kickoff. So I expected Liverpool to really crank up the pressure and to to really, you know, kind of eat into our goal difference. But lucky that's not happened. So I feel much better about it now. 
Andrew, the deadlock was broken in the 24th minute, as we can see on the screen, courtesy of Premier League.com. And it was our captain, Martin Erdegaard. Now, he'll get all the plaudits, as maybe will Kai Havertz for the assist. But it all started with the boy that you singled out at the start, Emil Smith-Rowe, winning the ball out of possession. Talk us through the goal and, and talk us through what you made of the finish uh, from the captain. Yeah, I mean, really alert from Smith-Rowe, wasn't it? I mean, just ex doing exactly what Arteta would have asked for him, which is like put the pressure on high up the pitch, stealing the ball, nice little pass off to to Havertz, who, you know, was very, very calm in the way that he took his time, picked out Erdegaard. And I mean, the way that Erdegaard kind of sliced across the ball like that, I mean, it was just a beautiful finish with his left foot. And um, I mean, he turned and he immediately kind of, ran pointing towards Havertz to to thank him but I noticed in the highlights if you the camera reverses and you can see Zinchenko going straight to Smith Rowe and saying that was all you and it really was you know that was you know Smith Rowe basically doing the Odegaard role right the the, the bit just before the goal um and I, I felt like he took a lot of confidence from that as well you know like he he needed something to kind of you know, a, a real goal contribution in a match, which was important at this time of the season to just kind of give him a little bit of a boost. And I felt he fed off that. Um, yeah, he was very, he was very lively after that. But, um, you know, Havertz and Erdegaard striking up a nice partnership. I mean, we've got some lovely bunching in the kind of goals and assists from the, the midfield striker guys. And I think, uh, what was that? That was Erdegaard's 10th goal of the season, all competitions. Wow. Can't really, you know, for a bloke who had a bit of a slow period earlier in the season, you know, 10 goals and seven assists, that's that's no bad return. And then, yeah, Havertz is on nine goals and four assists. So I'm I'm genuinely impressed by, by what those two are doing at the moment. I feel like they are first names on the team sheet stuff at the moment, which is kind of incredible because I don't think anybody at the beginning of the season would have seen Havertz as, as, as that player necessarily. Um, and, yeah, I mean... I don't think many people would have necessarily been surprised if Havertz had been taken out of the team before the game, maybe, you know, given Jesus a run out. But he's retained his place. He's made a telling contribution. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it was a I, it was a goal at a good time, right? Just before the crowd started to get any more tetchy than it needed to, you know, because we weren't exactly playing at 100 miles an hour in that, that opening period, kind of feeling our way a little bit. And uh, it was a goal at a good time. Yeah, I know that's a, 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 a real cliche, but it definitely helped settle things down. And I think we went from strength to strength in the build up to the to the half time at that point. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I was lucky enough to be in the Arsenal box last night uh, working on the breakdown show. Thambi Lakonga came in as one of the many guests who joined us for that show. And he predicted that the, the goal, the, the game, you know, the first goal of the game would be scored in the 25th minute. Uh, so 24 is pretty much bang on the money. And he was in good spirits, by the way. You know, he's recovering from his injury. He's really enjoyed his time at Luton. He's loved working for Rob Andrews, Laura, wouldn't we all? Um, and I think he's looking forward to coming back to Arsenal this summer. Uh, not sure what the future holds for him, but he's looked promising at moments. I think they've been raving about him down at, uh, at Kenilworth Road. So hopefully he has something to offer. As we move to the second goal, and I'm just going to bring up the old field tilt FC, uh, which is what we love. We got the goal just before half time, and again, it was neat work from Arsenal down our left hand side. Trossard playing the ball through, and, and Emil Smith Rowe running in behind Laura cuts the ball across. And in the end, it wasn't sadly a goal for Reese Nelson, it was actually Daiki Hashioka who put it into his own net. Yeah, it, re like a really nice goal, um, and kind of a continuation of the theme where we'd obviously just been, been doing what we normally do, which is you know passing it around, playing it nicely, etc. I think at that point, I did think the floodgates would open a bit more than they did. Um, obviously, it was, it was quite close to half time, um, but there was a sort of sense of, right, on we go. You know, that's the two, let's go four, five, six, whatever. Um, and I think obviously the half time um, sort of maybe stopped our, our momentum a little bit. I have, you know, observed Arsenal when they come out for that second half, they are often a little bit soppy for the first couple of minutes. Um, and... You know, often that can be just, you know, half the crowd's still getting a beer, that kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, again, a really nice piece of play. And I just thought from then on, we would just put the foot down. Um, but we didn't. Uh, we just decided to give ourselves half of football off, basically. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's always important to score any goal, but to score just before half time and get that 2-0, that sort of buffer, it makes the half-time team talk and half-time experience for us fans a lot calmer. Andrew, when I've brought these field tilt charts up in the past, they've tended to be mountains in the favour of us. <laughs> these are more sort of, you know, small hills stroke potholes <laughs> with a real deep divot for, for Luton in the second half. I mean, 
it's unusual. Like, I don't think I've seen Arsenal play with this sort of tempo or intensity. And Rob Andrews' comments after the game saying that Arsenal can mix it up. They can be, you know, very versatile in terms of playing style. Um, it, do you just summarise it as just, a, you know, a nice day at the office? We've just got the job done and that's it. Let's not talk about it too much more. Yeah, I, I, I do feel like context is everything with this game. Like, that City game was emotionally and physically draining for everyone involved and I think you know Arteta in making the changes that he did pre-game was kind of holding his hands up and kind of accepting that and 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 saying okay how do we feel about Luton we think we can get past them and you know I think at 2-0 at half time I mean that would probably be as as ideal a result as he would have been expecting at that point I mean you know the guys hadn't overly strained themselves but they'd managed to find a way through um I mean, it really bugs me that uh, Smith Rowe doesn't really get a, an assist registered for that for that own goal. Um, I feel like, you know, and I don't know how it works with XG and own goals, um, how those get rated as well. So I was wondering a little bit when we looked at those stats about how low the XG looked, because, you know, that was a near on, you know, <laughs> that couldn't be as close to a, a one on the XG one front as far as, yeah, exactly. Indeed. So, um, but yeah, I, I think, I think context is everything. I do feel a little bit like, you know, those automatisms that uh, uh, Wenger used to talk about between players kind of weren't really there because those relationships, you know, there's a lot of guys coming in who hadn't played a bit of football, not necessarily quite on the same vibe and uh yeah as, as you might expect so but i did notice some some positive things you know the party and Erdegaard. i felt that connection kind of picked up where it left off last season when party was kind of at the height of his game before he had that drop off in the in the tail end of the season you know he plays much more vertical passes and possibly quicker passes than maybe rice does i think rice likes to have a touch and carry sometimes um but Erdegaard kind of instinctively knows where to go when party's on the ball. And I saw some slickness there. I think, you know, Ben White didn't really push himself too much. I mean, he's played a hell of a lot of football. And again, you might easily have looked at the bench and said, is he someone who we could have replaced at, uh, at this point? But I think, you know, we're probably still looking at Tommy Asson. He's feeling his way a little bit. Um, so, I mean, I honestly, I was, I was genuinely looking for a controlled performance. I didn't need us to kind of go out there and absolutely batter anyone. I feel like we've kind of got credit in the bank over the course of the last couple of months, you know, putting some of those big scores on the board. Uh, at this point, what we need to do is have calm, cool heads, which is exactly what we didn't have last year. And things got a bit emotional, as the critics suggested. Um, but at the moment, I just feel really very bullish about us. I mean, we're not conceding chances, as Rob, uh, <laughs> Rob, your love said after the game. Uh, it's very hard to create anything against us, and I never really felt like we were in danger. And if we, if we had conceded, I still would have felt pretty confident that we could have turned to the bench and 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 thrown the kitchen sink at them and found a way through. We didn't need yeah. to. I think I think you're right, mate. Uh, listen, we, again, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm much more relaxed about this fixture. I saw it as an opportunity to really go hard. Luton, you know, depleted squad at the wrong end of the table. It was a chance for us to, you know, we were tuning up at half time. We should have just gone for, for gone for the kill, got a third, got a fourth. It wasn't meant to be. Felt a bit sorry for myself. And then, of course, Liverpool have won tonight. And actually, it's not the end of the world. I think uh, your point about, um, you know, control, Mark Berlin's comment earlier, Arsenal just showing maturity at the business end of the season and I'm here for it and that's right and um you know I went for a went for a meal uh, last night after the game uh, Laura you'll know Yembele he sort of turned to me and just said you know well would you take the next eight games just 2-0 to Arsenal <laughs> and I bloody would so you know sometimes you just got to put things into context uh, we talk about it being a nice day out we talk about you know getting um some rotation in the team it was about minutes and legs and you know it was good to see Thomas Partey back in action uh, first start and Emil Smith throw the real star of the show. Did any other individual players catch your attention? Let's start with you, Laura, first. I mean, what did you make of the the new players coming into the team? I think um, in the first like three minutes or so, Party won the ball back in the middle of the field and immediately played one of his like sumptuously weighted passes straight forward into habits. Don't think anything came of it, but it was literally like, ah, this is the player that we that we miss, um, and you know, that he has those sort of moments of brilliance. And I still think he offers something totally different uh, when he comes in. He's just so direct. I think Emil Smith-Rowe, him and Odegaard, 
you know, if I'm completely honest, when sometimes when I'm looking at the pitch, they look like the same player to me because I've not got my contacts in and I'm like, this, is this is this Odegaard or is this Emil Smith-Rowe? They've got that same kind of... Emil Smith-Rowe, once he's got the ball, is very, very difficult to stop and Odegaard is exactly the same. Um, so I think both of them... I know if you if you if you look at sort of Twitter today, every other tweet is different about Party. It's like, yeah, he was useless and rusty, and everyone. And then the other half is he, you know, he's back to his best, etc. I think we can all agree, Emil Smith Rowe showed what we, what we've been missing. Um, I think when it comes to Nelson, he tries. I think he he he's one of those players that you know gives everything. He doesn't stop running. I think he made some important defensive moves as well. I think. It, one in particular, I think he was almost the last man and he, and he put in a tackle. Um, but I just, I don't think he's at the level that we need. I, I don't, I don't think he know, I don't think he fits into the side. I don't think he knows where he's meant to be. And I don't think he's got the skill that we need and we can't, I, I'm, I'm surprised that we offered him a contract and I'm surprised that he took it. Um, I, I just don't think he's the level that we need. So that was my only kind of, you know, he wasn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, but I think against a better opposition, if we need to play him, he's not as effective as we need him to be. You know, the Bournemouth goal aside, if we are in a similar game in a couple of weeks' time, I think we've got Bournemouth at home or any of those ones where perhaps we do need a goal. I'm not looking at Reese Nelson to be that person. And if we are trying to rotate, he's just, he's good enough. He wasn't terrible, but for me, it was quite it was quite obvious last night that he's just not on the level we need him to be. I think the way that I look at it is that Reese Nelson got minutes in his legs and it it helped, you know, other players not get minutes in theirs when they need, you know, so much rest and um, you know, Thomas Party the same. It's important that Declan Rice, who was, you know, played into the ground by England, understandably so, captain the captain the national team, which would have been a huge moment and honor for him. You can't knock a player for wanting to play for their country, but you know he's he is also not a robot, and so you have to give him a rest. And this is probably the fixture that Mikel saw. Uh, Andrew, of the fringe players, we've singled out Emil Smith already. He did actually win the Man of the Match award. To all the points that you made about him being a hail end product, you know, he's been at the club since he was nine years old. He's obviously a talented boy; just hasn't quite worked out for him um, so far. Is he maybe knocking on the door? Or has he maybe sort of just let Mikel know that, you know what, I'm here. You can trust me. Uh, you know, you can use me in, in situations. He's been largely an unused sub this season, but last night's performance was really promising. Well, I mean, let's think. I mean, if Erdegaard, God forbid, got a knock or something in the next couple of days, I mean, who 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 becomes your kind of number one guy to go and play in the pocket um, behind the strikers? And, I mean, Emil Smith-Rowe was doing it before Erdegaard was, so you kind of want to have that option available, I think. Um, I thought it was interesting that, you know, Vieira didn't get on at all last night, who's another one who's kind of vying for that kind of backup position. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, a, he's an interesting one, Smith-Rowe, because I really feel like he's a he's a sort of confidence player. Um, you, you can see he's absolutely desperate to get on the score sheet. You know, he even spoke about it after the game about being disappointed. I think he's one of the very few outfield players who hasn't scored yet this season. I mean, he's obviously not played very much. That was only his what third start, and the first time I think I had a look today at the stats, the first time he completed ninety minutes in almost exactly two years, um, which wow. is crazy. You know, his development has really been stunted by that groin problem and the knock-on effects of it, having to have surgery, um, but. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of focus on him as well because of obviously the Saka comparisons having come through at about the same time. Martinelli obviously came through in that Chelsea game that, you know, kind of changed Arteta's time in charge really at the same time. And those two have kind of accelerated upwards and and, and he's kind of slowed a little bit uh, in the last two years. It's a shame, but, you know, football's a ruthless game and Arteta is a particularly ruthless manager. And we've seen him kind of switching out players that he just doesn't think can do it. And Smith Rose, you know, he's just not been ready. I don't think he's showing signs he might be. I think the problem for him is: Are we going to get to the end of the, how many more games if Erdegaard stays fit? Is he actually going to start? I'm not sure. Might get a few more bench appearance, you know, appearances off the bench. Then the season ends, and that momentum that he's just built up is gone again. So you start asking questions: Okay, where does he fit in the team? Uh, what are we going to do in the summer? Where do we need to raise money? Are there people interested? And suddenly, you know, his whole future's in doubt. So, I mean, yeah, I just hope he has a strong end to the season and any minutes he does get, he he, he sort of does his best and 
uh, I hope he gets that goal because I think a goal would be a really nice thing for him, uh, you know, going into this last bit of the season. Yeah, I think you're right, mate. Uh, you know, it's it's always nice to see a, an academy product shine and play for the first team. And, you know, I've got a lot of sentimental attachment towards the Millsmith. I always wanted him to work in, you know, the, the older fans sort of watching will know I love Paul Merson when I was growing up and he reminds me a lot mm. of him. So that sort of, you know, that close control, the way he sort of runs directly at, at the opposition defences. I really want it to work out, but I, I, I fear that maybe the ship has sailed for him in terms of becoming a first team regular. Maybe there is a chance for him to put himself in the window and get a move in the summer. But the most important thing here is that we have suddenly got a bench of players who look and feel hungry, who are mm. decent when you can call upon them. And that's going to be priceless for us in the, in the run-in. Uh, and the last thing on him was Smith Rowe, um, you know, his journey, from my perspective, there was a time under Mikel Arteta where he wasn't working as hard as you wanted him to. He looked a little bit overweight. He looks lean. He looks quicker. He looks hungry. You know, the tackle for the first goal is is not something that we would have um, seen Emil do too much in his earlier days at Arsenal. It was so a bit Pires on uh, Vieira, I felt, from that Juventus game all those years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was. I like that. Um, but, you know, I, I just I wish him all the best. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, if we if we move to sort of Reese, I think the get, you know, time has time has come for him. I think I don't think he's going to be at the, at the club beyond the summer. At left back, finally, just before we talk about strikers and the title race and, and sort of come to an end. Um, Sinchenko played. He took a lot of stick from people that I was sort of sat with. I think it's because, you know, first game, he looked a little bit rusty. But Tommy Asu's coming back to fitness. Um, is he the person that you'd expect to maybe finish our season? Uh, Laura, let's start with you, because Kivio's come in and done a good job. But presumably Tommy Asu is, is top of the pecking order. I think he would be. I'm I'm still not convinced he's kind of fully fit and, and is is ready for us to rely on um, in that way. Um, I think he's still probably carrying a bit of a knock by, by the looks of things. Um, and I think Kirill just offers a little bit more stability um, just because he plays that sort of, you know, very traditional left-back role. I didn't think that Zinchenko was that bad last night. I think, yeah, people around me were losing their losing their heads with, with him. Um, but I think it's that sort of recency bias of... And you know, sort of selective bias of we, you know, we have we have painted Zinchenko with this brush of someone who consistently makes mistakes. So every slight mistake gets blown out of out of pr proportion. Um, I still think there is a place for him in our side. I just I do worry, you know, the mistakes that that happened last night. There were just a couple where him and him and Gabriel obviously had some sort of um, you know misunderstanding. The ball was left loose. Those sorts of things could be punished by a by a better opposition, I would worry about um, playing Tommy Asu every game. I think he's clearly, you know, not in a in a kind of fit state to be to be doing that. But I think Kiwior has proved that he that he is more than he is more than good enough to to either kind of swap in and out or or, or start. Um, and Tommy Asu coming off the bench is is you know is a really strong option to have as well. I just worry about his fitness a bit. Yeah, I agree with you. He's just got to come overcome those soft tissue injuries. Uh, OK, let's move away from uh, last night's performance. It was a fairly ordinary sort of day out. We got the job done, the three points, minutes in the legs. Smith Rowe shines. Fantastic. On to Brighton we go, and we'll finish the show by looking at your team selections for Brighton. The question that I want to ask is, and, and Andrew, I want to get your thoughts on this, um, because I know uh, Ask Blog has covered this at depth, you know, the, the sort of Kai Havertz, the influence that he's had on this team. Arsenal.com posted that picture on the right-hand side that Havertz has now been directly involved in 12 goals in the Premier League this season. So eight goals, four assists. Now his outright most in any single campaign in the competition, which is phenomenal. So that's a real sort of <laughs> shitter on Chelsea um, who have just beaten Manchester United. Ha ha ha. Um, and you look at where the goals are coming from, courtesy of now underscore Arsenal, the graphic on the left. These are goals in all competitions. We don't have, I mean, even though Bukayo Saka's notched up 16 and like you said, Erdegaard is now on 10. Kai's only on nine. Trossard's got a few there. We don't have that prolific goal scorer, but do we need one? Because the team is working really well. What are your thoughts? Well, last season, the, the team scored the most goals an Arsenal score, side has scored in the Premier League ever. You know, more than any of the best uh, Arsene Wenger sides. And this season, they've been bagging goals for fun recently as well. And there's a fairly high chance they could go and top that. So... It's just a different take on things, isn't it? You know, people would love to 
you know, this idea that we might sign a striker who'd go and sit up top and then suddenly we'd add an extra 30 goals. I don't think it really works like that. I think those goals would just be funneled a bit through more, you know, more through one person rather than being shared around. I mean, there's definitely safety in having the bunching that we have at the moment with lots of different players capable of scoring, working positions all over the pitch, not being reliant on a single individual. I do think, though, we're probably getting to a point with Gabriel Jesus and this knee issue that we might need to think about, well, if he and, uh, well, let's say Nketiah goes in the summer because I I feel like he's not going to sit on the bench any longer. You're then looking at Gabriel Jesus as the main man with habits around there, you know, as the the kind of the other option as a, a, a bona fide striker, let's say. Not even really bona fide, but I feel like you need something else there. I just, I don't trust Jesus' knees, unfortunately. I think what we're looking at here is a situation where, He's played that game against Nottingham Forest because he wanted to. He's exacerbated a situation. He's then spent some time on the sidelines. He's come into the team the other day, but there was absolutely no way we were going to play him twice in a week. And, you know, we need to to monitor that situation. I think uh, it's it's concerning for me. And I, I think Arteta and Edu will be looking at it and they'll be thinking, OK, we're not necessarily getting all the goals that we were hoping for out of Jesus. We found other ways to score goals. Um, his fitness is an issue. Maybe we really need to have a, a, a genuine, you know, think about the type of player that could come in and really challenge him. And look, I don't even think it's unrealistic to 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 say that Jesus could go in the summer. You know, Arteta's been really ruthless about some stuff. Mm. He's served a purpose. You know, he's taken us to the next level. He's completely changed the mentality. But. I don't I don't put anything past Arteta at this point. You know, he's a guy who constantly wants to evolve, wants to improve the team. I don't have any names for you. I don't really know where my preference lies because obviously, you know, anybody who's uh, worth their salt is going to be, well, worth millions, hundreds of millions probably. Um, so it's difficult. But um, yeah, I think we'll be on the lookout for someone up front. Well, it's good to see that in the absence of that someone, we are scoring goals from all over the pitch. Bukayo Saka, as one or two of you have pointed out quite rightly, is looking prolific with those numbers. Gabby Martinelli's not quite had the season that he had last year, but of course, you know, he's been out. Hopefully he comes back from his cut and he makes a big difference in the final sort of six to eight games. Um, if I, just, I want to ask you one question, both of you, just get, get your thoughts on this. So if Saka and Martinelli are both fit, and let's say Bayern Munich fixture was tomorrow, who are you playing up front? Are you playing Jesus? Are you playing Havertz? What are you doing? Are we playing Bayern tomorrow? Yeah. Is that the question? <laughs> it's really difficult. Isn't <laughs> it? Okay. All right, I'll go. Go on, Andrew. I think I think we stick. I think we stick with Havertz. Do you know? I think Havertz I is really bringing like the best out. Brings. Yeah. Th- he's bringing the best out of a lot of other players. Um, I feel like the team. He gives you – it's not the same dynamic option as Jesus who run around like crazy, but when you look at Havertz and his physicality and the jewels that he wins and the discipline with which he presses and his ability to hold up the ball, I think he's maybe a, a slightly tidier player than Jesus, which is amazing really because at the beginning of the season he didn't look that tidy at all. He looked very kind of nervous on the ball and uh, his passing was a little bit off. But, yeah, now I look at him and I think, well, he's a player in form, right? He, f- he feels like he's at the top of his game. Arsenal are obviously reveling in it by throwing up stats like that on social media. So I would I would go with I would go with Havertz. Also, you know, don't underestimate the idea of a you know this is a, a a Germany international going back home knows what the Bayern Munich uh, crowd is like, what the atmosphere is going to be like. You know, I think he'll have some words of wisdom for the rest of the team about what they can expect. So yeah, I'd I'd, I'd stick with him. I think just just to add, I think also. If I'm if we're getting to the, near the end of the game, say we're you know seventy minutes in, and we need a goal, are uh, in, in his current form, Habits is the man. You know, I think he 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 is the one that you'd look to and go. Do you know what? I still have confidence this team is going to score. Jesus is just a little bit chaotic, um, and I'd, if he's given a 50, 50, 50 chance, he's just not bearing it in the same way that I think Habits in his current sort of form just would. So, given how tight these games are likely to be. You just want to look at someone and go, yeah, I think Habits has come up with some really good, really important late goals for us this season. So, you know, you'd, ha- you'd have to go with it. And I think someone said in the chat, Jesus has obviously got a good record in the Champions League, but so does so does Habits. 
Um, so, you know, he, he knows what this game is going to be like. Um, but when we need goals, I think he, he is the man. Indeed. I just like the fact that Mikel's got this headache, you know. And, and of course, Eddie's waiting in the wings, you know. He's, he, when he comes on, and he, he, he can... No, he can't. Who am I kidding? No, uh, but he <laughs> we will see what we will see what happens. You can tell the football's finished because we currently have what's he saying? Three thousand five hundred ninety-six people watching wow. live on Twitter, which is insane. Uh, please do get involved with Latte Firm on socials and get involved with Andrew and of course Laura. Um, so yeah, the football is well and truly finished, and the numbers have shot up. Let's move on to the title race then. We saw painfully today that Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool have somehow done it. They can't keep getting away with this. <laughs> How much longer is this going to go on? I just honestly, I I'm 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 so emotional about this. Right, the image on the left hand side, obviously courtesy of Sky Sports, looks like he's going to run away with it. I don't, it doesn't make me very happy. The fixtures are beginning to run out. Eight fixtures left each. As I said at the start of the show, Liverpool now have five away games in their final eight. Three of those, Fulham, Everton, and West Ham, take place over six days after a grueling trip to Atalanta just before that. So maybe that's the turning point for them. For us, of course, lots of people have been talking about, we've got to go to Spurs, got to go to Old Trafford, who, you know, Manchester United, you know, one day they're brilliant. They knock out Liverpool in the FA Cup. Another day like tonight, <laughs> absolute circus. Very unpredictable. And Manchester City, Andrew, who have got pedigree and experience of coming good at this start, you know, this stage of the season. And of course, they won their game handsomely last night, 4-1. What's your thoughts on the title race, Andrew, in general? Because people obviously who watch Latte Firm won't be too familiar with your, your thoughts. They've never seen you on the channel before. So, you know, what's, what's your, where do you think the title's going? Who do you think has got the easiest run in, et cetera, et cetera? Um, <clears throat> I, think the, I think City shouldn't be written off. I mean, I know anyone writing City off would be slightly crazy because it's not like there's a huge gap at the top there. But there is a bit of me that just thinks City's running is probably the kindest. Although I do look at that last game at Spurs. Well, actually, it's not even been decided when that game will be played. Uh, but Spurs won't want to do us any favours. Spurs fans will hopefully, you know, they certainly won't want to do us any favours. So I just, I, there's something about City and the relentlessness of City and the whole pep thing that makes me think that they're still the favourites. Liverpool, as you say, have got that kind of run of tricky away games. I actually think they have got, you know, we've seen Fulham turn over sides, including us at their place, you know, an away game at West Ham. West Ham can always turn up and cause you trouble. You're never quite sure. Spurs, Spurs have had some some big results at Liverpool in the last few years, I think. So I, I see their running as being quite difficult. I'm not kind of looking too far ahead. I mean, obviously, as supporters, we look further ahead than maybe the manager does. But, you know, uh, to be honest, if we're still in the race going to United with two games to go, then I think we're doing pretty damn well. Um, I think this weekend is going to be a real tricky one because our, you know, we're, we're sort of split between looking at this game, which we have to win, and also that Bayern game, which is such a monumental game for the for the club as a whole and, and our sort of standing in Europe. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the same time, like last year, I was last year I was waking up and I was just thinking about the title race the whole time. Like it was just all consuming, you know, I'd come home, I'd put North London forever on. And, you know, it was just like this thing was just washing over me. It was this year. I feel really quite calm. Like, as I said earlier, the, the word I'm using is bullish. Like I just look at our defense and I'm so sort of confident that if they stay fit, we're not going to let teams score many goals against us. And if you don't let teams score goals against you and you've got the quality of attack that we do, you know, you're going to win games. So I just think we need to keep ticking them off bit by bit. Try not to spend too much time watching the other two live because I think it will drive you absolutely nuts <laughs> and just hope at some point that there's a slip up. And look, not those, all three teams aren't going to win all of their games between now and the end of May. Something's going to happen. And we just have to hope that it's not to us. Uh, but yeah, I think Liverpool might have a little bit of a slip. They're just just something about them. I feel like the emotion of the Klopp departure is going to get to them. Uh, and they've obviously got the Europa League as well, keeping them busy, as you said. So yeah, I, f I feel confident that we'll, we'll still be in there to the end. But for me at the moment, it's a City, Arsenal, Liverpool, one, two, three. Oh, Liverpool third. Yeah. I mean, look, the, the fear that I've got, 
is that we end up playing Man City in the Champions League. You know, if we're yeah. lucky enough to get through Bayern Munich, and of course, they're just so good. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can. T- I, don't, I this season might do me in. I don't yeah. know if I can take <laughs> two legs against City, and it will probably be around the sort of Chelsea Spurs time. I would imagine. Yeah, we're um, away, aren't we, in that second leg? So it'll be home. Oh. At- yeah, so we're yeah. <laughs> second leg. <laughs> you of the, want to of the throw up? I, feel I, sick. Think, I think I'm right in saying that. What, oh. what, okay, I've got a question for you. Let's flip it on his head. If we got to that stage of the Go season on. and it was a semi final against City, and you suddenly thought, well, City, you know, would you take going into the Champions League final and, and sacrificing the league at that point and then just having a pop at European glory with who's on the other side of the draw? Yeah. You're seducing me, Andrew. Yes. Uh, because it maybe. sounds so bloody good. At, Wem- at really Wembley. Oh yeah. my god, where Mikel Arteta has never lost as a player <laughs> or coach. No, I don't. I've got I've got I've got a wedding that went that day of the Champions League final. Mate, you're I not you're canceling that wedding. This. You are you are coming with me to Wembley. That's what you're doing. Oh my god. I mean, Andrew, look. Yes. Yes, I, I yeah. oh my god, it's so hard because I really want the Premier League and people have yeah. been watching me for for you know over the over the months that we've been doing this channel they know that the premier league means so much to me like to to be to to be able to bang you know beat your chest and say we are the best team in our country you know you, and is is you know you, you you probably experienced it oh there's nothing no feeling like it and yeah oh it's so hard what would you do i mean i've always said that the league should be the aim and that the champions yeah. league this year was a bit of a free hit but the prospect of kind of being upset over two legs and losing to City <laughs> in a semi-final does make me want to gag and be sick. So it's it's really, really, it's really, really difficult, isn't it? It's I think so hard. we're just going to have to buckle in and just see what happens and hope that something happens. One of the two. I'll take one of the two. Yeah, I don't know which, that... <laughs> but if ending ending up with nothing is is obviously the the one I fear the most because. The other two teams will just be lording it over us. Everybody else would be laughing at us as well. So I, I, that's oh, the thing no. I just can't cope with. Everyone in the chat is saying Champions League. Everyone in the chat. Really? Simon Wong says, good morning from Singapore. <laughs> We're top of the league. On we go. Yeah, everyone's saying Champions League. Um, oh, <laughs> Wally says, FK told me it's better not to win the Champions League because it makes Arsenal unique. And now I'm buckling under the pressure <laughs> for Andrew. Yeah, listen, listen. Everyone's won the bloody the Champions League, the European Cup. That's what makes us unique. We're the biggest club <laughs> in the world because we haven't won one. We'll win it when we want to, pal. Don't worry about it. Um, Laura, just just to finish off the title race. I mean, look, we, you're on the show quite often. I don't want to put you on the spot every week, but are you feeling slightly different? Um, do you do you look ahead to this weekend's fixtures, like Andrew said, as 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 maybe a, a, a milestone sort of match round? Because United away for Liverpool. You know, as as awful as United are and as unpredictable as they are, we saw what they did in the FA Cup. We know that on paper it's a massive fixture. United fans, United in particular, are not going to want to give Klopp that fairy tale ending. Brighton away is a difficult fixture, of course. Uh, they've beaten us a few times at the Emirates, but we did dispatch of them very comfortably last year, and they're, they're you know they've got lots of injuries. And Palace away, really unpredictable. I mean, I mean, I'm expecting City to go to Palace. I think it's the early kickoff on the Saturday, so timings come into play as well now. City play first on Saturday. They could go top. We might then overtake them if we can beat Brighton. And there's a Saturday afternoon kickoff. Then the pressure's back on Liverpool. Is this a big weekend for you, Laura? Yes. I mean, every game is a big game now. That's not, that answer to that question is never going to be. No, no, this is a, this is going to be a chilled one. Um, I think the, if you look at, you know, week by week and sort of ranked every each of the three's fixtures, Liverpool away at Man United is one where you might have a, teeny bit of hope you know this could be one very very slim opportunity where they where they slip up even if you know even if they draw I I can't see Man City coming away from Crystal Palace with anything but three points and I think I actually I actually agree with Andrew when I when you think about their run in they just they just get into this motion and even when they go one nil down you know it'll be three one they go one all you know it's gonna be four one um because they've been there before um but Something about the game last night and the game against City just makes me feel a little bit more confident. And as as Andrew was talking through that there, I sort of came full circle multiple times from going to, well, obviously it's going to be City, it's always City too. But but what but what if it's not? 
what if it's Arsenal? What if what if this is our year? Um, but then what if it's Liverpool because Klopp is leaving and it would be a lovely fairy tale, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, so to answer your initial question, FK, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I'm just going to try and try and enjoy it step by step and not completely lose my head. But I will be secretly probably a little bit disappointed if, if Liverpool don't slip up at Man United here. Yeah. You know, when I look at these fixtures... This is how much of an emotional mess I am, right? I look at individual fixtures and think, oh, yeah, that's a tricky game. Yeah, they can absolutely take results. And then I look at our fixtures and think, yeah, yeah we're going to win every game. <laughs> and then I have moments where I'm like, oh, my God, Brighton away. Oh, my yeah. God, Unai Emery yeah. coming back to the Emirates. Oh, my God, Wolves. Pedro Neto is going to come back from the dead. Oh, my God, Chelsea. Like, yeah, there's, there are there's so a lot of many. Like, yeah. it's really messing with my mind, um, as you can tell. Uh, but listen, the race is on and it is there to be won. And on Saturday we head down to the seaside. So uh, the final segment of tonight's show is just basically your thoughts, uh, guys, uh, on team. You know, do the big guns come back into the team? Uh, Andrew, let's start with you. A couple of comments here. Afsar Gunner says, Brighton will be a hard game, 100%. Oisin saying this Brighton game could be very, very sticky. I think I agree with Oisin. Um, what are you doing with the lineup, Andrew, for Saturday? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, well, Saka comes in straight away, doesn't he? Um, I think the big decision is, is does he stick with party or Jorginho uh, come back? I think that's a, that's a big one. Uh, obviously, Rice is going to come in for Smith Rowe or whichever way he's going to jig it around. I think I'd, I'd basically expect it to be a version of what we did at City, pretty much. Um, try and revert to that and then see how Gabriel Jesus' knee is and whether or not he's fit enough to start. I think the thing with Zinchenko is if you play Zinchenko, you're probably less likely to play Jorginho because you're going to let you know Zinchenko be the one on the ball, dictating the tempo and stuff. So, I mean, I, I, I Brighton obviously don't have Matoma, who loves to give people a, a bit of a run around, has given people a run around before he got injured. Yeah. So there's one less sort of thing to worry about on the break there. But they're just a very mobile team and they do a lot of things that aren't always expected. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think Arteta will end up playing it safe relatively. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Kivio. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Tommy Asu. But I think it's more likely to be one of those two with... Rice and Jorginho back in the team, Erdegaard in front, Saka, Havertz, and then maybe Martinelli or Jesus over Trossard, who I thought was pretty quiet last night. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think Mikel's going to ring the changes. I think the big guns are going to be back in Declan Rice. I would expect to start Jorginho. Here's an interesting one. If Jorginho and Partey are both fit and both capable of 90, what do you do in the bigger games? What do you do at Bayern Munich? Maybe not one to answer today, but just something to sort of ponder. Laura, what are you doing with the lineup? Do you make as many changes as Andrew, bring all the big guns back in? Yeah, I, I actually wouldn't start party. Um, I think he I think the home games are where we can where we can kind of ease him back in. I think we've been so strong away from home with Jorginho. I would just Im immediately revert to that. Um Trossard, I, I think he was quite quiet last night, but I think from a defensive point he he can be quite useful. Um in terms of sort of running back, he made a couple of really important blocks as well. But I would basically go what we did at City um, and, and go from there. A party still worries me um, in terms of starting away from home. Um, I still think he needs a little bit of time to kind of bed in, whereas Jorginho, for me, is, is gives me that sense of comfort um, in the middle of the field. Fair enough. So predictions, Laura? Brighton Arsenal? 2-1. <laughs> To Arsenal. Oh, you're, you're not confident, are you? Andrew, prediction I'm never confident. today? I'm going to go 3-1, but it's going to be hairy. Ooh. Yeah. Don't I think they'll make us that. work for it. Mm. Oh, dear. Don't know if I can take that. I'm going to go with... Uh, do you know what? I, I think we'll be comfortable. I think we... Will we concede? I mean, we just don't look like conceding goals, which is fantastic. <laughs> um Brighton are a very I, weird team this year as well. I mean, like yeah. their results are kind of whoosh, whoosh, like yeah, all over really, the place. Really, really unpredictable um, yeah. with what they're going to do. So who knows? Right. Uh, I think we're going to call the show there. Uh, listen, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, we are live count now, viewer count. 
3,907 on Twitter, which is insane. Thank you so much for making the time to tune in to us. I think that's some sort of record. I'm sure it is. Uh, if you are, of course, watching for the first time, please do subscribe to Latte Firm. Lots of content like this to come. Get involved in socials. If you've enjoyed what you've seen, also connect with uh, my distinguished guests. So Andrew is at A. Allen Sport and Laura is at Laura Kirk 12. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Um, you're going to like this, Andrew. You're going to like this. Here we go. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> right. Here we have. You can see on your screens that Liverpool are top of the league, unfortunately. Boo! They are top. 70 points. They have a two-point lead over Arsenal, who are in second place. We've lost four games. Are we going to be made to rue that West Ham defeat and that Fulham defeat? We shall see. The goal difference remains in our favour of plus six, though, which is good. Manchester City in third place after pumping Villa last night. Phil Foden hat-trick. Their goal difference lagging behind. Plus 38. They're a point behind us. They, of course, go to Palace on Saturday. Aston Villa doing their best efforts to drop out the top four and letting the enemy in. But actually, do you know what? Thinking about it, maybe we need Spurs to be as competitive as possible to make those games against Liverpool and City count for something. Who knows? Manchester United, after their embarrassing defeat tonight, conceding in the 90th plus 10, 90th plus 11 at Stamford Bridge, losing 4-3, are down in sixth place, surely. All but all hopes of Champions League are over for them. West Ham in 7th, Newcastle in 8th. As we scroll down to the bottom half of the table, Chelsea have now climbed out of that. Wolves lead the way in the bottom half of the table. Luton Town, our opposition from last night, sadly just in the danger zone. Rob Andrews FC. Come on, Rob. You can do it, Rob. I'm sending power and love to you, Rob. I love you, Rob. Uh, Burnley in 19th. Sheffield United, of course, the worst team in the Premier League, not doing us any favours tonight. And that is how the league table looks. Uh, let's fade the music down. And thank you all once again for joining us tonight. Yeah, that's my little thing that I do uh, on Latte Firm. And it's very it's dramatic. Just... I love it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. People seem to love it as well, which is great. Uh, listen, Andrew, have you enjoyed your first time on the phone? I've loved it. It's been great. Thank you very much for having me. It's been, um, it's been. you know, I love the positive vibes as well. I'm feeling good. You know? Well, listen, you are welcome anytime, my friend. And Thank uh, you. it's not usually that we have a, a live fixture go that's so comical in the background. <laughs> I'm now going to race away and watch all the highlights. I think Thank you, Laura, you, also. you're going to enjoy watching that fourth goal. I can't wait. I cannot. I cannot wait. Oh, McSauce. What a player. Right. Look after yourselves. Um, have a great Friday wherever you are in the world. Um, enjoy the days to come. Arsenal go to the seaside on Saturday to play Brighton. And this could be a big, big weekend in the Barclays. Bye for now. <laughs>